So that night you can go online and watch a cantata. We have a, a few people who have offered to share their gifts with us, uh, and we will record them and, and, and put it all together in one nice little video. Uh, but we could use some more. If you have any talent in singing or playing any kind of instrument, or if you work in an ensemble, if you're able to work with a duet or a trio or a quartet or whatever uh, to produce uh, some sort of Christmas music that would honor God and be a blessing to the rest of us, we certainly invite you to do that. The deadline for submitting those videos to me is next Sunday. Uh, so if you're able to do that and you'd like to do that, please let me know and then get the video to me by next Sunday so I can begin putting it all together. Um, let's see, what else? Alvina Amundsen's funeral is this Thursday at 2 p.m. If anyone's interested in attending that, uh, as we have done before, we will also make the funeral service available online. Uh, so if you're unable to be here, you can, you can watch it later that day when it is posted. Um, there's other important announcements in the bulletin for you to take a look at. Hopefully you'll have the opportunity to do that uh, at this time because we know that she's going to be watching. We'd like to sing happy birthday to um, Dorothy Nissen as she celebrates her 92nd birthday this week. So uh, if Lois is ready to go, we'll sing that now. season we are continually reminded of and encouraged by our Lord's promise that he is coming again soon. Therefore we are to live our lives in a state of preparedness for his return. That's the message of today's opening hymn, Arise O Christian People. May God bless us as we prepare for worship by singing our opening hymn.
name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God, our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake God forgives you all your sins. Therefore, as a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our intro for today is taken from Psalm 126. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who then our mouth was filled with laughter, and in our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. Those who sow in tears shall be with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. We continue with our Kyrie. In peace let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above, and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord.
Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, through John the Baptist, the forerunner of Christ, you once proclaimed salvation. Now grant that we may know this salvation and serve you in holiness and righteousness all the days of our lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated. The Old Testament reading appointed for today comes from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 61. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. They shall build up the ancient ruins, they shall raise up the former devastations, they shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations, for I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrong. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their offspring shall be known among the nations, and their descendants in the midst of the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge them, that they are an offspring the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exalt in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its sprouts, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to sprout up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before all the nations. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle reading for today comes from Paul's first letter to the church in Thessalonica, chapter 5. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole body and soul, I'm sorry, your spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. This is the word of the Lord. We rise now out of reverence for the gospel and prepare for it by singing the Alleluia and verse. The Gospel according to St. John, the first chapter. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. And this is the testimony of John, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed, and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, No. So they said to him, Who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, then why are you baptizing if you are neither the Christ nor Elijah nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know. 
even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany, across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. We continue now with our sermon hymn, What Hope and Eden Prophesied. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. They asked John, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, No. So they said to him, Who are you? This is our text. As some of you know, nine years ago, I went to Russia with some other Missouri Synod Lutherans to visit the orphanages and nursing homes that are supported by Orphan Grain Train. As you can imagine, there were many experiences that left a deep and lasting impression on me from that trip. One of them occurred uh, at a nursing home that we visited uh, on the last weekend when we were there. Now, there are all kinds of stories I could tell you about that afternoon, but the one that relates to today's message is the one about the papers that were hanging on the walls over the beds of the people who lived there. You see, each large room had about six beds in it, uh, each with their sides pressed up against the wall. And above each bed was tacked a piece of paper. Some of those papers had all kinds of writing on it. Some of those papers had very little, if any, writing on them at all. So I asked someone who would know the answer, what's the deal with those papers? And I was told that those papers contained all the information that they knew about each resident. In some cases, the caregivers knew a lot about that person. In other cases, they didn't even know that person's name. And you see, due to the various ailments and afflictions that some of the residents had, some of them weren't even able to tell the caregivers their names. So their papers were blank. Sadly, those blank papers almost made it seem like that person didn't exist. Now, having read all kinds of books on leadership and communication, I know how important a person's name is. It's a part of their identity. When someone remembers your name, it's a powerful affirmation of your importance. That's one of the reasons why a pastor tries so hard to learn the names of his members. That's why I tried hard, so that I could acknowledge the unique importance of each one of you and affirm for you that you matter as a fellow brother or sister in Christ. Of course, I have a terrible memory, so I also get embarrassed when I forget someone's name. A person's identity is a very special thing. Who are we? And who do we think we are? 
And who do other people think we are? Those are all very important questions. So how do we answer those questions? In other words, how do we identify ourselves? In this crazy, mixed-up world, that question has taken on a whole new dimension. Simple classifications and descriptions aren't so simple anymore. Gender, race, group affiliations, and daily vocations, those are the ways that most people use to identify themselves or to identify others. Now, since I don't want to get too far off track or offend anyone, I'll just stick with that last category, daily vocations. And these vocations include titles like mom, dad, husband, wife, child. When I was a kid, I remember grandpa referring to grandma as mother, as in, mother, can you go get that for me? Now, at the time, I didn't think there was anything strange about that. And in fact, I thought it was kind of sweet. Now that I have a wife and children of my own, I find myself doing the same thing. Regardless of whether it's right or wrong, more than any other identification, I usually refer to Tracy as mom. Now, I'm sure that psychologically, that's probably not the best thing to do. But it never really becomes an issue except for when my own mom comes to visit. Then when I say mom, no one has any idea who I'm talking about. I'm not sure why I started calling Tracy mom. It must be the fact that that's the relationship which I most often connect her to. That's usually how it is for all of us. Our identity is wrapped up and defined by our relationships with others. So who are you? By what relationship do you identify yourself? Are you a parent, a spouse, a member of a particular organization or an ethnic group? Whatever it is, I hope that above and beyond all other relationships, you define yourself first and foremost as a child of God. That's because although all other relationships are important, the one with God is the only one that gives eternal life. It's also the only one that will never change. We are God's children forever, and not even death can change that. Having been baptized into Christ, we have not only been united to him, we're also united with him into the relationship that he has with his father. Now, we don't share Christ's divinity, of course. That's not part of our identity. But we are holy and precious and loved more than we can imagine. And even though the law defines us as sinners, because we have sinned against God with our thoughts, our words, and our deeds, God defines us as his saints. Luther described our Christian identity as one in which we are both desperate beggars and beloved princes who have already inherited all of our father's estate. We are brothers and sisters in Christ, but not only in Christ, but also to Christ. He is our brother. Therefore, we are all one family, united by faith, united by the love of God, which holds all things together. And we have this blessed status, not because of who we by ourselves are or by anything that we've done. It's all because of Jesus, who he is and what he has done. As John said, he is the light of the world. In today's Old Testament reading, the prophet Isaiah declared some of the things that Jesus would do when he came because of who he is. He would bring good news to the poor in spirit, those who sorrow over the sins they've committed. He would bind up the brokenhearted, those who have been damaged by the sin that has uh, uh, harmed them in their lives. He would proclaim liberty to those held captive by their sins. He would blow open the gates of hell's prison, which confines people in the darkness of their unbelief. And he wouldn't just set them free. He would proclaim the Lord's favor to them. But the wicked ones who caused God's favored ones to suffer on account of their faith in God, they will know God's vengeance on the day when he returns. Yet, for those who belong to the Lord, that day will be a source of hope and peace. 
That's because we know that when Christ comes back, he will take from us our ashes of sadness and the faintness of our spirits and exchange them for his beautiful garments of righteousness and praise. In fact, he's already begun doing all those things for us, and he will continue to do them for us until the final day dawns. Regardless of the sinful fruits that we have borne on our corrupt branches, he calls us oaks of righteousness. Obviously, this is not our doing. But this is who we are because of who he is and what he has done for us. He has clothed us with garments of salvation. He has covered us with his own robe of righteousness. By his ugly suffering and death, he has made us his beautiful bride and adorned us with the jewels of his glory. That's who we are. By God's grace through faith, that is our identity in Christ. And I pray that by the guidance and inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that that's always how you will see yourself. If so, then you'll be able to do as Paul wrote in today's New Testament reading. You'll be able to rejoice always, to pray without ceasing, and to give thanks to God in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And if you do all those things, continuing to hold fast to what is good, then others will see it too. About a hundred years after our Lord ascended, his church was still growing and expanding to all four corners of the world. And as it did, those who didn't know anything about Christianity had questions. Dionysus was one of those people who had questions. And so he wrote to one of his friends because he knew that his friend had been in contact with Christians and he knew something about them. And he asked his friend, what's the deal with these Christians? Here's what his friend wrote back to him. Christians are not differentiated from other people by their nationality, language, or customs. Wherever they are, they follow the local customs in clothing, food, and other aspects of life. But at the same time, they demonstrate an unusual form of citizenship. They live in their native lands as aliens. Any country can be their homeland, but for them, their homeland, wherever it may be, is still a foreign country to them. That's because even though they pass their days on the earth, they consider themselves citizens of heaven. They marry and have children, just like everybody else, but they do not kill their unwanted babies. They will share a table with anyone, but their bed with only their spouse. They don't mind being poor, because they consider themselves to be rich. When they are dishonored, they count it as glory. They bless those who curse them, and behave kindly towards all. Despite being persecuted by all, they love everyone. In fact, they go joyfully to their deaths, believing that by it, they gain life. My dear friends in Christ, wouldn't it be great if the people in our world identified us like that? During this time of Advent, we are encouraged to reflect on our lives and repent of the sins that come so easily and naturally to us. And we can do that joyfully because we know that we have already received God's promised grace. And we believe that because God says so in his word. And through that word, we are absolved of all of our sins and declared holy and righteous in God's sight. Therefore, we truly are saints. But like John, we're still not the light. But hopefully... Through the lives that we live, we can be faithful witnesses to the light. Of all the things that we are and all the ways that we can be identified, I hope that you'll always remember this, that you are a forgiven sinner, a holy saint, and a beloved child of God. That's who you are. And by God's grace through faith, that's who you will always be, now and forevermore. Amen. Having heard God's word, let us now stand and confess our common faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived. 
by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of the saints, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we face all kinds of struggles throughout our daily lives, we thank you for your promise to always be with us and to bless us with all that we need to endure until the day when your Son comes again. Grant that by your Spirit's power, we might believe all the gracious promises that you've made to us in your word and live joyfully as the redeemed saints and beloved children that you've made us to be. Gracious Lord, among the promises that you've made to us, we trust you to grant help and healing to those who call on you in their times of trouble. Be merciful and kind to them, and according to your gracious will, give them the restoration and strength that they need. We ask this especially for Beth, Elizabeth, Ruth, Belwyn, Amy, Michelle, Stephen, Trevor, Rebecca, Melody, Rosemary, Heather, Madeline, Giselle, Linda, Jim, Roger, Chuck, Peggy, Ken, Kellen, Paul, Mark, Sarah, Orlin, Darlene, Jean, and Donna. Holy Spirit, we give you thanks that you have united yourself to us through the waters of baptism and bestowed on us your promised gifts of grace. We especially rejoice with those who celebrate their baptismal birthdays this week, including Angela, Donna, John, Irene, Sawyer, Rob, Luke, Marion, and Kim. May they and all of us continually live and rejoice in all the identities that you have bestowed on us when you adopted us to be your own. Almighty God, you rule the whole universe and everything in it is under your loving care. Therefore, we ask you to protect us from all the effects of this virus, to help those who are struggling financially, to heal those who have been harmed by violent protests, to have mercy on those who suffer from the sins of others, to bless those in prisons and orphanages, and to sustain those who rely on the weather for their livelihood. May you work good in all things and give to your people those things that you know they need. Finally, Lord, we ask you to bless, guide, and keep the leaders of your church on earth, including Matt, our synodical president, Don, our district president, Don, our circuit visitor, and all the leaders of St. Mark's who serve us in a variety of ways. May your spirit rest upon them all and work through them so that they are enabled to continue faithfully serving you and this congregation. All of these things and whatever else may be on our hearts and minds today, we lift all of it up to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We continue now at the service of the sacrament. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, whose way John the Baptist prepared, proclaiming him to be the Messiah, the very Lamb of God, and calling sinners to repentance that they might escape from the wrath that will be revealed when he comes again in glory. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. Remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ, on the same night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. And in the same way also after supper he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us now stand and join together in singing the post-communion canticle. Thank the Lord and sing his praise. Let us pray. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, you have given us a foretaste of the feast to come in the Holy Supper of your Son's body and blood. Keep us firm in the true faith throughout our days of pilgrimage, that on the day of his coming, we may, together with all your saints, celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his favor upon you and give to you his peace. You may be seated now for the singing of our closing hymn.